welcome to Level Up, a podcast for independent artists navigating the Asian music industry. I'm your host, Giselle Cole. I'm a music journalist, the founder of Platform Asian Pop Weekly, and an all-around Mandopop nerd. Join me in taking control of your career as an artist, and I'll show you how to make the most of it. Hey guys, and welcome back to yet another episode of the Level Up podcast. So... This week, we're going to start our new topic in the Level Up podcast, which would be digital distribution. As some of you may know, I do work in the digital distribution side of the music industry full time. I work as a label manager with the Taiwan arm of an aggregator called Believe Digital. And so digital distribution has always been a topic that's been super close to my heart just because I feel like the way that I started consuming music and really falling in love with music was really very much digital. Whereas other people were afforded the opportunities to go for live shows and cultivate their music, their love for music that way. While I was in Perth and really interested in Chinese music, that really wasn't an option for me. So the only way that I got my fix was through digital platforms. And so I've really been there since the beginning, um, from before even the advent of digital streaming platforms. And I've really seen how digital distribution has shaped the music industry as it is today. And so I think it's a really important tool, especially for artists who are wanting to go into different markets than the market that they already are physically based in to really get their digital distribution strategy right, have a good team to help you with that and see where it goes from there. So for this episode, we're actually sharing a recording of the webinar that we did with the amazing team over at SingPop. Uh, SingPop is an organization, a non- non-profit organization in Singapore that is meant to help local musicians, especially in the Mandarin music scene, but just Asian music scene in general, to, I guess, level up which is exactly what we're doing here today as well. So I really want to thank everyone over there for their support and also for letting me reuse the content of the webinar, which incidentally was about how are you going to bring your music to greater audiences through the world of digital distribution. So over the course of the webinar, I've gone through some basics like what kinds of things do you need to know when you're picking your distributor If you're working with a distributor, how are you going to provide them with materials that will put you in higher sit and a more competitive position to get the resources that you need to push your own stuff? And also tell you a little bit more about how the greater China music industry and like streaming industry works because that is an area of expertise for me. So I think it's really important for what it's worth to be educated about how digital distribution works because end of the day, when you take out live music from the equation as we have now in the COVID pandemic, the only most direct way that you can monetize your music is through streaming platforms. There is no other way that I can think of anyway. As musicians, if music is the core product that you are creating, then it just makes sense to find a way to monetize it somehow and make the most of it. So yeah, without further ado, let's head over to the recording of the webinar and I'll see you on the other side. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Sing Pop Live Streamer. Let your music be heard. Of course, today we have our special guest. Um, by the way, I'm Terence here, <laughs> one of Sing Pop's member. And we have Hubert and we have Giselle. Okay, let's uh, get uh, Giselle to do an introduction. Hi, Giselle. Would you like to do an introduction on your... your what do you do? And yeah. Giselle, is from, um, Giselle is from Believe Digital, right? Yeah. Hi, everyone. So it's great to be invited by SingPop to be here and speak with you guys about digital distribution. So basically, I think most people will know that I am a label manager with Aggregator Belief Digital. Uh, I mostly work with the Taiwan team and I sometimes deal with a little bit of like uh, Hong Kong and also some Singapore clients, but mostly Taiwan. And uh, other people might know me as the founder of Asian Pop Weekly, which is one of uh, the main platforms which helps to make Asian artists' music accessible for like wider and international audiences. So, yeah. Anyway, we'll get uh, Hubert, our colleague, in from Singapore. Uh, Hubert, maybe we can um, 
Yeah, do a self introduction as well. Let people know you. Uh, hi guys, uh, my name is Hubert. So I'm a singer songwriter and producer. I'm also one of the co-founders of Sing Pop. So uh, I met Terence through Sing Pop and then Joselle because she's uh, the labor manager for my Taiwan company. So very honored to have Joselle here with us today. So if you guys have any questions, uh, do feel free to ask because she's really the expert in this. She has uh, done so many releases uh, with her time at Believe and also her time previously all the way till now. So um, we have also seen like massive, massive good results from her as well. So if you guys have any questions about distribution, how to make your song uh, get heard on platforms and stuff, just ask in the comment section. So we will try our best to answer your question. Thank you, Terence. Thank you, Matt. Okay, well, um, so let your music be heard in this live stream. Like, I, I believe there's a lot of, you know, the people who are attending this live stream will be budding, art, budding artists, musicians, you know, and of course, producers who are looking for talents. They want to release their music. So, I, I mean, jo see, Joselle is from um, Believe Digital, right? I, I, I believe that you have in, you know, the experience to tell us, you know, to let us know how can we make our music go on the digital platforms worldwide? How can we actually release our music? So right now, for example, I'm a budding producer, okay? And I've released a track. So from re after I've released the track, how do I go about doing it? So what, what do I look out for next? And what, what do I do next? Yeah, so basically the, the way things works is that if once you have a track and you want to put it onto like Spotify, iTunes, whatever, all those platforms, you can't do it yourself. You can't go direct to all those platforms. If not, the platforms will have too much work. So that's where aggregators like Believe or The Author or TuneCore, CD Baby all come into play. Um, basically, as an independent artist, you would need to find a distributor to help you to put your music online. And so I think that there are two different like distribution models. Like the first one is more DIY. So that's uh, things like CD Baby or TuneCore where it's like a flat rate. You pay a flat rate and you get 100% of your royalties back. But that one is more of like a very DIY approach. So you don't get hands-on personalized support. It would just be mostly, uh, mostly the focus would just be on getting your music onto the platforms and maybe limited support in other areas like pitching and things like that. Um, and then the other option for you would be like a distributor who uh, has more of an account management focus. So instead of a flat fee, the uh, distributor would have a percentage split. And in most cases, they would have customized supports with people such as myself who are like distribution experts who can help you with like your strategies and inform you, like inform your strategies and help you to optimize your uh, your music for release yeah and advise you the best that we can uh, based on what you want to do with this with with the release yeah so I think it depends on what kind of artist you are but if you are super new and you don't really know anything about distribution I would recommend maybe trying out a DIY distributor first just so you get used to the system and then start building a body of work which you can then take uh, to maybe pitch to someone like Believe or like um, the author or one of those uh, account management based platforms where they are, they are a little bit more exclusive because just because we are face-to-face -face communication, communication with um, the artists, but overall, like we do want to support all kinds of independent artists. So yeah, it uh, if you feel like um, you need our help, definitely you can reach out to like our Facebook page or Instagram and definitely we can see whether we can help you. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks. Okay. From, from what I know, right, Hubert is also um, had released his music as well on Believe Digital. Maybe Hubert can share a little bit of his experience and stuff. And what, what are the problems that you meet um, you know, during the distribution stage after you have produced your track? Uh, for me, I think the bigger problem was when I first started out myself, right? So uh, when there were like no following on social media and everything, um, the hardest part was to allow people on different platforms to hear your stuff, be it on Spotify, on KKBox, or, or for example, on Jukes. So the hardest part is really how do you get your song out on the platform? That's the first step, right? So how do you let people know about this track um, like throughout so many releases every single day? So um, we all know that we all put in our effort in doing a good song. Like we, 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 we write it from scratch all the way to the last production. We spend so much money on it. But then ultimately, I think a lot of uh, new artists, uh, when I first started out myself also, uh, I really didn't know how I could get resources on the platform uh, to allow my songs to, my songs to get heard. You know, because like uh, on Spotify, we have like playlists, 
uh, on KKBOX, we have playlists and we also have like DJs on like on the platform. So I think there are a lot of uh, gameplay in platforms that we as artists, we don't really know, although we are avid users of the platform, but we don't really know how to get this stuff on board. So I think the most important part uh, is when a digital distributor comes in to assist in that because um, they have so much experience in doing that. So like, for example, Believe, they have a huge, uh, rich history of uh, um, getting songs online and also getting good playlists and stuff. So with these experiences, I think the label manager or whoever that you're working with is able to guide you through step-by-step step on how you can get your song on the playlist, uh, how to get more stream count, how to allow more people to hear your songs on this platform. So, uh, I think at least from my experience, uh, because previously I I tried all the online platforms like in uh, CD Baby and stuff, but um, may- maybe because they are based overseas, they they are they don't really focus uh, on the Chinese like on the Chinese market, right? So uh, I think you should find a distributor who really really knows what you want, which market you're aiming for, uh, what are you trying to do with this song, what's your marketing plan, etc. So this label manager or the distributor will be able to give you more resources that. Uh, suits your needs. I think that's quite important. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. Maybe, maybe my next question to Joselle would be: How how do you actually garner more stream counts? For for example, maybe you know once it's released on digital platform, what are the steps that you know an artist or producer would need to take, or perhaps maybe Joselle can share a little bit on how would it be like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I think what Hubert said is very logical. Like uh, as an independent artist, you definitely would feel like, oh, the distributor is the one that will help you to like directly uh, influence your stream counts. And I think that is true to an extent, but also you can't just rely on the distributor to do that for you. There are different, that I think there are many different um, pieces of the puzzle that need to fit, fit together in order to create like synergy and to create the best effect for your stream counts on your track. But I can start first with what Believe can do or like an aggregator can do for an independent artist. And mainly that would be our trade marketing service. So most um, most distributors, like the account management distributors, they would have a trade marketing team of some sort. And what this team does is that they will help you to pitch your music to all the different platforms and um, let the editors hear it. And if the editors hear it, they're interested, then maybe they will, it will result in playlisting or banners. And there's a lot of um, evidence behind the fact that if you get playlists and banners, it will directly affect your stream counts. And also because um, these playlists and banners are directly native to each of the platforms that are being used. So of course, there is a greater guarantee of um, these uh, playlists and resources affecting your stream counts. But as I said, things like social media and also the artist mar- marketing and promotion plan, I also think are very important in influencing in the first place whether or not that distributor will, no, sorry, not distributor, the platforms will want to support your release because it is a two-way street. As be- believe we are like an independent distributor. So um, you can't, we feel like it's, a collaboration between us and you as the artist. So if you want us to help pitch, sure, that's definitely fine. But you also need to share with us like a really good social media campaign or like a marketing and promotion plan overall where the distribution, how the distribution fits in, how the social media fits in and what you're going to do be in terms of PR or um, any interesting campaigns that will actually get um, the distributor involved enough uh, to be able to communicate that to the platforms and get you the resources that you need. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Joselle. All right. Maybe also we also understand that you you are you are also currently the founder for Asia Pop Weekly. Maybe you can share a little bit on what Asia Pop Weekly does. And yeah. 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 So basically, we started over ten years ago, and um, the aim of this platform is always changing. But I think overall, our aim is to bridge um, the gap between cultures like the East and the West. And so increasingly, we've been focusing on helping Asian artists, no matter if they're like from Asia or like from the Asian diaspora, to get their music heard overseas or by international audiences. And that's the reason why Asian Pop Weekly as a music journalism platform is completely in English. But also, uh, we do do a lot of work in terms of bridging, like with lyric translations and things like that, to try and help uh, overseas audiences to engage with this music and really develop, um, I guess, 
develop their love for it because that's also that's the music that we love and that's the music that I identify with as the founder. So yeah. Wow, thank you. Wow. That's interesting. So we know mm. we, we know at the same time, you know, we have another platform that supports the music and stuff, you know, helps to do the promotion. And from what we understand just now that you mentioned, uh, a lot of times it's two ways. So so it actually essentially depends on the artist plan itself. And of course, uh, you know, whichever platform they choose to work with, they also have to understand that, you know, it works two ways. So as mm. much as, you know, perhaps, for example, I'm the artist, I will need to pre- prepare myself to, to, to actually do a little bit of radio releases, do a bit of this, a bit of that. And together with the digital platform, then our song will go further as well. Am I right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think it's not necessarily just with distribution, but I guess anything related to distribution and promotion, it is a two-way street. So as an artist, you do have to be organized and you do have to be uh, presenting yourself in a particular way, in the right way. And, pre- and giving the platforms no matter if they're media platforms or streaming platforms, you have to give them a reason to support you. Yeah. Okay, nice. So, okay, maybe I'd like to ask as well, for the current distribution channels, right, how, how is the market share like in Singapore, Taiwan, you know, the users on KKBox and stuff? Maybe you can share a little bit. Um, so, if you're, dis- if you're speaking specifically about belief, I think what I can share is that we are top tier preferred partners with Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. And actually we are one of the only distributors who are able to monetize TikTok. So I think that's quite rare. Like most people, they can get their music into TikTok's back catalog, but not necessarily um, will it be monetized. And also I think in terms of, I, I have the statistics for Taiwan and Singapore here, just roughly um, for Believe and TuneCore, which is also Believe's um, company, under, under belief, KKBox is about 4% market share and then international platforms is around 8%, so Spotify and iTunes. And for Singapore, uh, KKBox, our market share is also quite strong at like about 5% and then international platforms is 7%. But if you are speaking about specifically like the market share in general on like Singapore, Taiwan, Malaysia and um, the kinds of users and what kinds of platforms they use, I would say um, Taiwan... The biggest platform at the moment is still KKBox. Um, it has just over a majority share, maybe around 50%. And then uh, Spotify and Apple are kind of tied or together make around 30% market share in that market. And another interesting player in that market would be YouTube Music. So even though YouTube Music only, uh, only started maybe a bit over a year ago, but it already is growing very quickly and has a market share of about 20%. So yeah, that's the current situation in Taiwan. I don't have the specific figures for Singapore and Malaysia, but what I do know is that um, I think the international platforms are still quite dominant in um, Singapore and Malaysia. Um, with KKBox, KKBox is quite small market share. Um, and Jukes may be a bigger one, especially in the Malaysia territory. Yeah, But I think the focus will still be on the international ones. Okay, cool. All right, thanks for the insight. Huh? I think definitely mm-hmm. useful to actually understand the different markets and stuff. I think as artists or as producers or as someone that wants to release song, maybe, you know, it, it's also very pretty important. Am I right, Hubert? To learn about the market share. You mean to learn about yeah. the market share? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is, it is, it is. Because um, I think one of my biggest mistakes as uh, because at the time when, when I first started out, I didn't really have like guidance from people, right? So, it was for me really all about trying to pave my way out. So uh, at that point in time, there were a lot of trending platforms. Like for example, uh, as Josiah has mentioned, uh, KKBox is one of the biggest uh, players in Taiwan, right? So, um, but then my aim was Taiwan. At all, all, the, all, the, all the while it was Taiwan, but I didn't think that way. Like for me, I felt that because I was in, I was in this environment, I tried, I tried my best to uh, put more efforts on the Spotify. So like, for example, when I shared my stuff, I only put my Spotify link, but I didn't put KKBox link, right? So um, I think this might not be one of like the bigger things, but I feel that it was a pitfall for me because if I knew that the market was what I wanted to go into, and then I knew that the platform was that platform that uh, I know that was going to be the, 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 the platform that I was going to aim for, I would have have done more preparation work for the platform mm-hmm. and then like for example there are different features also if i'm not wrong if, if i'm not wrong joshua please correct me if i'm wrong but mm-hmm. like um kk box there is uh, all those like djs that are playing yeah and they can spin your songs and they can yeah. help you get more get more get more spins mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. then spotify is mainly 
uh, playlist and then I don't know submission submission to Spotify editors or even your uh, distributors mm. but at least for me I felt that if I knew more uh, like DJs on KKBox I could have approached them and asked them whether they could put my song on their playlist and then get more spins mm. so I think uh, that for me is quite important then also like for example in Malaysia if I'm not wrong all my friends are using jokes mm. they are not really using like Spotify or uh, KKBox they're using yeah. jokes but then jokes is not available in our region like we can't open jokes in Singapore not in Taiwan because mm-hmm. ge- ge- geographically like l- region lock yeah 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 so mm-hmm. I think it's important to know all this because if not you will just be uh, like trying to put all your eggs in one basket and then uh, not identifying which audience you are trying to target for so I think that's quite it's like, it's, mm. it's kind of like selling selling your music, you know, in a language or in, to a place that doesn't know your existence and stuff, and mm. it's not your target market. So I think most probably, you know, it will be important for all musicians or all, all artists who wants to release their track to actually understand, you know, to, to kind of like position themselves. Uh, I mean, from the A and R perspective, from label label perspective, it will be like positioning the, mm. the product and positioning the artist. Where should we position? I think that's yeah. very important. Okay, and maybe. also, sorry, I was yeah, just no going to add to Hubert's yeah. point. I think what he said is correct. Like, definitely you should just focus on one platform, especially when you're distributing to so many platforms because if you only focus on one, then it will be like you're in an exclusive deal with like a mainland Chinese platform, which you're not, and they're also not giving you the resources. So why bother? But also the, an, another danger I think that a lot of art- artists fall into is that they tend to overstretch and they care about too many platforms. And then they give the distributors pressure over all these platforms and they're like, oh, I want my um, I want my profile to look perfect on all of these platforms. Even though when you look at their actual stats, their streams are only coming from like four platforms. So I think it's like getting that balance. I obviously don't put all your eggs in one basket, but also don't overstretch and try and do too much because end of the day, like I said, that's why market share is important to know because like if the major market that you're in, it's just like, for example, those three, pla- those four platforms, then why there's not much, I mean, it's not as much of a priority to focus on other platforms unless you are really going into a market where those platforms are more relevant. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Josel. Thanks for, thanks for all this information as well, uh, Hubert. I think... I think it's important like, in this case to understand where, where we want to position ourselves. But at the same time, right now, we have got some questions from the floor. Okay, uh, em- Emily. Hi, Emily. Um, actually, Emily is asking, do, do you know where we can find good a and in Singapore to pitch our music in sync placement? I'm currently a two core artist and wish to promote my song in terms of placement. So maybe, um, yeah, I think Hubert can share about this as mm. well. And maybe Joselle can also share about this. Maybe from Joselle's per- perspective, maybe Joselle can talk about, you know, um, how, how do you go about doing all these things? Um, so if they're with Chinko, I'm actually not 100% sure whether we actually do any much pitching on that end. But if she was just looking at like getting promotion in that in the Singapore market space in terms of like media or um like radio and things like that my best suggestion for independent artists would just be to look at what other local artists are doing where are they getting placements and then try and figure out like just stop basically like see what how they're getting there or how can you reach out to uh that platform or whatever that is providing those kinds of placements and then just be personable be nice um, provide lots of information about yourself and then and tell them, say to them clearly, like what you're looking for. Like, are you looking for a news article or like an interview or whatever? Uh, yeah, just just be clear, but also be don't be too pushy, and hopefully you'll get some responses. Yeah, I think Hubert might have some insights on this as well. Hubert would like to share. Yeah, sure. I totally agree with uh, Josel that. Uh, I totally agree with her that a lot of artists don't prepare their decks well. So like, for example, now there's this opportunity and then when asked for like their profile, they're unable to produce something that is decent enough or mm. solid enough to mm. get that deal. But we must always understand that there are so many hungry artists out there, like so many, not just in Singapore. Let's, let's, if you, if you take it out of Singapore, there's Malaysia, there's Taiwan, there's Hong Kong, there's China, whichever, which, whichever they are, right? So um, the I always feel that one of, even my problem is that I don't try to sell myself 
enough. Like I don't try to package myself enough. I don't, I don't try to uh, brag about myself as much on these kind of decks. And I think that's very important because when these thing placements opportunities come and when you have a solid deck or a solid piece of information for them to consider you as an artist to be uh, placed in their uh, magazine or even, for example, your songs to be on like the drama and stuff. Um, mm. I think that's a very, very important like pre-package that you need to prepare first. Mm. Then secondly, I think... Um, if Emily is asking about, um, for example, sync placements for TV or like movies, I think it's very important that you have to um, net you have you have to have enough network or like network enough to have these people in your contacts and network, so that when your song is ready, you'll be able to put this song out there for them to listen. And then sometimes a lot of times, I think one of the bigger problems is also that we don't package our songs well enough like we we just do it as like for example a demo and then i send it over to um like the the the, the person who is listening to the demo but it is not good enough because there are so many people out there if if you guys have been uh because i was i was part of like a, a few album a and r processes right and then when you hear the demos from overseas they are like really really crazy solid demos and it sounds like it, it can be released anytime and then uh, so I think it's really important. Like the whole packaging of yourself and your product must be really, really well done. And then when mm-hmm. you put it out, I'm very, very sure that if your song is a good song and then you have a very good package, uh, even if you just send it via cold call or just sign it via like email, email you might just get an opportunity. So uh, I think there is no back door for this. But of course, if you have a good network, your product is good, your packaging is good. I think... That that will help. That will that will have you let you have a headway lah towards mm. what you want. Yeah, that's yeah. what I believe. Yeah, I agree. I think from a media platform perspective, like most platforms, like if they are independent, not necessarily like under media corp or something like that. Most of them who are around in the local scene, they want to help musicians. If not, they wouldn't be around. But sometimes artists just make it hard for us to help them <laughs> yeah so i think like the artist better as you say actually we were talking about this with uh pew i don't know if she's listening but we were talking about this with pew on clubhouse the other day and i was also telling her like i think the bio is so important like having the artist profile as hubert said because like that is the place that you will be directing all these different people to no matter if it's your distributor or like media platforms or anyone who you want to reach out to and collaborate with. So that's what everyone's going to be seeing. And that's supposedly going to summarize you as an artist. So I think that's like super important. And yeah, I think um, the packaging in general, like how you present yourself is also very important. Yeah. Especially when you're cold calling and you don't necessarily have the networks. Yeah. Cause that's what they're going to look at. Wow, that's a lot of information. Yeah, I think end of the day is being open. A lot of a lot of times, I think you know we, we have all been through this. I believe as musicians, you know, uh, as A and R, as label from from producer perspective, we have actually seen a lot as well. So um, I believe end of the day, uh, more importantly in music, we are, we must be open. You know, we must be hungry enough, and we must be prepared. So if you know if any anything short of I, I don't think you know the artist is gonna succeed for sure. So end of the day, I think you know if, if let's say artists can get to look into all these areas a little bit more, I think the, the rate of success is definitely a lot higher. All right, uh, perhaps let's go into the next question. Uh, so are there any pointers um, that one should look out for before signing a distribution deal with a company? Maybe yeah. just can can help us answer this. Yeah. So I think um, this will probably be more towards account management based distributors because if it's a DIY distributor, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. But if you are signing a distribution deal with a company and there is a contract involved, I think there will be four main things that you should look into. First of all, you should look at the account manager that you are assigned to. I personally, I'm not just saying it up myself. I actually think it's very important because when I was working with a label, as, like as part of a label before, I realized that having a good account manager could mean the difference between like you getting placements, you getting more resources and you not getting anything at all because they are basically like your, your gatekeeper to get like to get to uh, get the distributor to pitch you to other platforms. So it's like there's so many gatekeepers, right? Yeah. So if you get past 
if you get an account manager who can really support you, uh, I think that's uh, that would be something that I personally would take into account. Um, the second thing is probably like contract length. I mean, most are standard around two to three years with some offering like a little bit more flexibility. But I think you should look at what that flexibility might mean because they might try and get other rights from you for more flexibility. But if it's a standard two or three years, the contract looks fine. Then yeah, that's, that's, that's how it usually is. Um, another thing that I would say is territory scope. So in general, it's not a good or bad thing, but most distributors want worldwide distribution. It just makes sense. And it also makes sense for most artists um, because if you just like if you're an independent artist, you just want to deal with one distributor, you don't want to have to deal with like multiple distributors. But um, if you have particular concerns about how this distributor can help you in key territories, then you should ask. Yeah, so that's another thing that you should probably look at. Um, the last thing is probably in some rare cases, distributors might ask to uh, cover your publishing rights. So Mm, this is a tricky one. So just make sure you know, you understand that they will be taking over your publishing rights and don't just go into it blind because I know some distributors very rarely might, might ask for that as well. But that might actually also be um, detrimental to your control as an artist. Yeah. Okay, sure. Maybe we'll go to that in the next episode <laughs> about rights. Okay, yeah. what are the common mistakes you know, um, most indie artists would face or do you think are the common mistakes that indie artists would make uh, from the distribution channel perspective? So are you talking about um, like the con in terms of the contract or? Yeah, in terms of contract, in terms of, you know, um, whether what to ask for and what, what not to ask for and stuff. Okay, yeah. I think the most common mistake that most indie artists do when signing a distribution contract is they don't read the full contract. Like, it's the simplest thing, but it's not our responsibility to tell you read the whole contract. It's your responsibility to read the whole contract and understand what you're getting into. And if there's anything within, that contract will literally state everything about your agreement with that particular distributor. And I think as part of belief, I can be very transparent. I think our contract is very fair. Yeah, but if something doesn't feel right, you don't understand something, then you need to ask. So that is where you should be asking questions. I cannot really tell you where you should be asking questions. I guess if you should be asking questions, it will be what I said in the previous question. But if you have, if there's anything about the contract that looks wrong, that should be where you should be asking questions, especially when you're at the stage of like, dealing with signing signing with a distributor yeah okay so maybe you can share as well you know how do you see the current pop scene landscape you know the, how, how, how's everything like right now you know the music scene industry even the listeners the preference what, what are the trends like you know from what you can see uh you know yeah. based on what you what resources you have on on believe digital mm. Um, I mean, if, we're, if we are comparing like Singapore scene to Taiwan scene, which is the two markets, I guess I'm more well-versed in, I would say the Singapore scene is, is more like, it's, I think there was a very famous Singapore artist. I can't remember his name, I'm sorry. But he was saying that Singapore is a music scene. It's not a music industry. And I actually quite agree with that fact because a music industry is one that is really like, is scaled up and that a lot of creatives who come to this particular place because there are opportunities here and that will contribute to like a proliferation of like resources and like a lot of money and that is what makes a music industry like uh, a music scene which is very commercially viable so I'm not saying Singapore is not Singapore's music scene is not making money I'm just saying it's not making money on the scale that a music scene like Taiwan is just because it's uh it's got it had a lot of more resources in the past and also um it's just been a cultural capital for like the Mandarin music scene for quite a quite some time now. So I would say that's the main difference between Singapore and um Taiwan. Um and I think the another difference that I find is that um with Singapore music scene, like there are not as many local listeners as for Taiwanese music scene. And I think I think it also comes down to like um, the whole culture because Singapore is like, 
Singapore has no natural resources. So everything, it's resources that is, it is a place that people come to and like ex, to export or import stuff. So that's, I think that's a reason why like sing, Singaporeans kind of have that mentality of not like, not, um, not listening to their own local creations because they always feel like overseas is better. So I feel that Singaporean listeners, they listen to a lot more overseas music, um, no matter if it's from um, the Mandarin side or from the Western side. But yeah, and I think it's a lot more, um, lot more mainstream overall. Yeah. Whereas for Taiwan, because it is a bigger market um, and it does have more of that history of like uh, original creations in this market, like a very, very long history of that since like the 1920s. So definitely they're going to be like a lot more local listeners for Taiwan music. And I think another main difference I, I see is that um, I think that in terms of streaming, the Taiwanese market is a lot more mature because even before Spotify was created, Taiwanese listeners had KKBox. And so they were already educated about how to use KKBox and how to pay for like digital music streaming. Whereas like China or like Singapore, Malaysia, like they were, they did not catch on to that trend until later on. So actually as a result of that, I would say overall, like the, in terms of the digital music market, that is also why Taiwan is a little bit more lucrative than like, for example, the Singapore music market at the moment. Yeah. So those are kind of a few of my takes. I don't know if Hubert has anything to share about this. Hubert, would you like to share from a perspective? I think I think as you okay. said, I think the population that we have and the population that they have is already a huge, huge difference. Yeah. And then besides the population, like Joselle said, the uh, because when I was staying there for for for, for like four four to five years, um, you can tell that the locals really support like local music. But in Singapore, I think because we are multiracial, so our mm. proportion is distributed amongst like, the English listeners, maybe the Malay listeners, the Indian listeners, the Tamil listeners, sorry, and then also the Mandarin listeners, right? So I think that being said, um, there's already this um, division in the number of people that are listening to something. But in Taiwan, it's different. So they, in Taiwan, they have like their local live houses, which are still um, really, really packed nowadays. And then they have like lots of concerts. And then also because I think with Taiwan's rich history in um, being like one of the most um, vibrant pop scene for the Mandarin market. Um, their past successes have helped them in garnering more support amongst the locals and also the government to support the scene, right? So uh, I think there's, a, there's already this difference in that. But I think uh, one of the biggest um, advantage for Singaporeans releasing music into Taiwan or, which, uh, or Malaysia or other regions, right? I think the difference is that we are, because we are multiracial and multi um, culture, right? Cultural. So our music in general has a, we, we, we are more understanding. So we can always do, mm. for example, like K pop. We can always do like English pop. We can always do like mm. Chinese pop. It's just where you want to place your talents in and or, or at, right? So uh, I think that's really, really our advantage. And you and for example, um, I've seen our local songwriters releasing songs. You can tell that they are, they are doing a Mandarin song, but then in this genre, mm. then the Chinese market, uh, they are still trying to catch on, or if not, like totally new in the market. So, I think that's our advantage, and I think that is something that we should always be looking out for and trying to create this, uh, like Singapore sound. Mm. Uh, I think if we do have that distinct Singapore sound, I think that will propel us further in the pop scene. Be it whether uh, in the Mandarin market, English market, um, the Vietnamese market, Thailand market, I think if we have that sound, I think it can go international. That's what I really believe in. So, mm. yeah, yeah. So kind of like it's a focus. Uh, amid diversity, we still must focus on what we are good at and perhaps, you know, churn out something good to represent Singapore and, you know, to stand on the world stage. Um. I mean, we, we have got, we have got artists moving from indie to major label as well. You know, people like Jasmine Soko, you know, Shigeshi and all, 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 all of them. So yeah, Fred Nord, um, let's look on to our next question. How much success do you see in indie artists release? So, so speaking of, you know, the situation just now, mm -hmm. amid, you know, this kind of situation that we have, we have no industry. So we only have a scene, but how can an artist, you know, achieve some success? I would say, do, 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 do we see any major artists moving into the indie kind of strategy? 
I think that it's kind of like there's some crisscross uh, along mm. the line right now. You know, we some we see some major label artists. You know, people like um, Penny Dye. You know, um, from Malaysia moving into the indie role, and of course we 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 have got um nine M eighty eight, DCD Zoe and stuff. Maybe mm. um from the label perspective, um, distribution platforms perspective, Joselle can share a yeah. little bit on this. Yeah. So. Um, something I've learned during my time at Believe is that as a music market matures, it starts to move more towards um, an artist-centric perspective. So it will move away from having a big label who takes care of like a lot of artists to artists becoming like business owners in their own right and like being able to have their own team and able to independently like um, deal with all of their operations themselves. And I guess that's kind of what you're seeing, especially with like the more established artists in Taiwan as well, for example, like Wang Li Hong or like Jay Cho or whoever, you know, JJ Lin, they're all doing something like that. So I think that it's a trend that we see in like more in markets which are slowly maturing. And, and I think we can continue to see that, especially in the Taiwanese market as well. Um, I, so I think there's no reason why an artist can't succeed as an independent entity as opposed to a label anymore like there's just no reason for them not uh for them not to be able to because i it really comes down to is this artist ready to be independent and ready to really um take on like look at their look at their music as a business because if they are not then maybe that is the reason why they are not successful in making the switch but if you really are then i think there is no reason why you can't garner the same amount of uh, uh, support from no matter the platforms or from any other stakeholders uh, when you're doing your release strategy so two um artists that i've had the pleasure of working with on distribution and are uh, joe and papa and dizzy dizzle and both of them are, I think, re really good examples because they both had the chance to go with a major label, but they chose not to. They chose to do it the independent route because both of them are like super organized artists who know what they want. They know what their sound is and they know that they have the leverage to do things themselves. So um, I think, as I say again, it you definitely can do it, but not every artist can. It just depends uh, whether or not you're willing to put in the work. Yeah. Okay, combining two questions, we have questions from Angela and questions from George as well. You know, maybe perhaps you can share uh, about what, what, which digital platform is the most popular in Singapore for English and Mendo pop. And at the same time, we know, I mean, the second question comes in, uh, I combine these two. So we know that there are other platforms such as My Music, QQ, Huo, and all those you know, NetEase and stuff. So are mm. they worth investing time and effort? Yeah, so I think the first question was about, um, I don't think you can really split the platforms that way in terms of I which platforms are more Mando pop centric which platforms are more English music centric I would say if we did have to split for Singapore, definitely KKBox is a very Mando pop centric platform. But as I said, it does not have the market share. So if the market share is still based on the, the major international platforms, then there's not, I don't think that it's very meaningful to do a split between which platform specializes in English music, which platform specializes in Mandarin music, because I think they both try and support both. Um, and for the second question, I think it's from Angela. Hi, Angela. I think she sent it to me on LinkedIn as well. So I think um, my music, let me, so my music is one of the Taiwanese local platforms. So it's owned by one of the telecoms companies. And I personally don't see so much value in it unless you are really, really, really invested in the Taiwanese market. The reason is because it has a very, very small market share at the moment in Taiwan. And we kind of predict it to be on the down, down slope. Yeah. Um, for the other uh, platforms that, that you mentioned, they are all mainland China platforms. So I'm just going to discuss them on the whole. I think... For mainland China platforms, if you are an artist who has a presence in mainland China or even if your music is in Chinese and you want to do a good job at your distribution, I think you can have like a secondary focus on those platforms um, because for Kuo and Kuo, they, they have smaller market share in the mainland China market. At the moment, it's mainly QQ and NetEase who are battling out. I think, no, wait. 
QQ and Google, they have the biggest market share and then followed by NetEase. But QQ and Google and Google are all under 10 cents. So it's kind of like if you distribute to Tencent and you're not under like an exclusive deal with any one platform, then you will distribute to all of those platforms. And as a result, I think you should definitely distribute your content to NetEase as well. Um, but definitely if you are in, so it's kind of the Tencent is like kind of take one, take all package. So if you're going to look after one of those platforms, you might as well look after the other two. Um, yeah, I think as a, if you are, a Mandarin artist and you are kind of seeing some traction or you feel that your music is uh, has potential in the mainland market, then that is when you should start looking more into these platforms. Yeah. And also including Douyin, which is the China version of TikTok. I also recommend that. Yeah. Oh, nice. Hope I answered the question. So being an artist is not easy. I right? got so many platforms yeah. to get off. So you got to decide where you want to distribute and, you know, perhaps, you know, work your way and strategy out or try to position your music, position your mm. artist's image. So I guess perhaps it's not a one-person kind of thing, or, you know, many a times it, it depends on a team behind the artist. And I, I believe a lot of um, budding artists, aspiring artists, musicians, um, I mean, from my perspective, I, I guess a lot of them have overlooked on this matter, where they, they only focus on, you know, I just make music and just want to put it you know, on the digital platform and everything will move on its own. So mm. a lot of people don't realize that. So perhaps, you know, we can have another session, another episode to talk about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. we have, time is running up. So we, we try to take as much, as much questions as we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, so how many streams on average can we, you know, I think this is a, out of curiosity. Like, how, how many streams on average can the artist start to measure success? I think I'm pretty sure Hubert will agree with me on this one, but I think there is no one measure for like an artist's success because the success should be measured by the artists themselves and each artist is unique. So that's why I can't give like a certain benchmark for how many streams on average. But what I do encourage is like, you should look at your numbers. You should really drill down into your stats on all the different platforms, on all the different social medias with each release and kind of see how it changes from song to song so that you can inform your future strategies on the platforms or on your social media. Yeah. So basically hard work equals stream counts as well. <laughs> so, I, I will not answer that one <laughs> I cannot guarantee that <laughs> okay so let's go to the next question how do I release a song you know get ready it's not like we have covered quite a bit on, on this already perhaps maybe a more structured manner um, to mm. let people know you know how do I release a song what are the things that they should get ready with yeah so I think the most important thing is to communicate with your distributor ahead of time you need to at least give it to them. I would say three weeks or even four weeks in advance is not, it's not too late. I mean, it's not too early. Yeah. So that's what, that's the main thing that I recommend. And once you start talking to them, they will definitely be able to tell you what they need from you in order to move forward with the whole process of pitching and everything like, and, and everything like that. And I think the things that you would need to get ready is as Hubert said before, your artist bio uh, your release plan. Obviously, you'll need the song file and any metadata you'll need to upload the song. Uh, album art is also super important and promotion photos. So from my time working at Believe, these are the main things that will make up a package that would help the distributor to like fully pitch your music to different platforms and um, let them have a good idea of what you're trying to do. Yeah. Hubert, anything to add on? I think Hubert... Um, on, on this one, how do you package? How, how do you manage to sync your song with, um, you know, with, with some China dramas and stuff? I think Gilbert has got some experience to share. I, I think for me, it was really like networking, like really hard, hard networking because um, I, I, as I mentioned, when I first started, I didn't have really have a support system. Like, like Josel and Terence, you all both mentioned that you need a team, right? But for me, it was really more of hustling out so when i first started uh I, it was more of like my own savings also my parents supported me of course uh then also going to taiwan knocking onto doors and then there was even once so for example like the china china placement the very first china movie placement i had was that i went so i knew there was sing ma Jiang, right so at that point in time sing ma Jiang, all the china directors flew into taiwan to take part in it and i knew that there was one director that uh he was looking for a theme song to my friend 
So I went to, I remember I went to Taiwan's like Shangri-La Hotel and I sat there for like five, six hours waiting for the director to come down. Like I just sat there and I just kept looking whether the lift opened and whether he came out of the door or not. And then he really did. So when he saw me, I told him that, oh, I, I'm this guy. My friend introduced me to you. Uh, can I have like a short chat? So he was rushing for his time, right? So um, I had my friend with me. So he drove lah. And he, he happened that he wanted to go somewhere. So we drove him there. So while on the car, I spoke to him about my plan and my song and my demo. So you so score my, as well lah, through, through the car. car. Hustling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so like my demo was already completed. I knew that it was something that I think would fit the movie because I also had the synopsis. So I, I I played I played for him on the on the car. Of course, he had a few comments. He wanted to change the lyrics and stuff. But at least when he left the car, he said, "Okay, I'll give you the deal." Right. So it was really like for me, it was really hustling. And when I first started in Taiwan, it was it was also like a lot of door knocking for me, and then like trying to hustle out everything, because um. It's difficult, but now that uh, like I think having this kind of webinars and like sing pop and even Asian pop really believe, for example, I think all these resources can be combined together to help artists to go through this very very rough patch. Because if you know, if I think being an artist is like running a business, it's not as exactly like you just do art and then you just release it. There's no way you can do that. I think like being an artist is really a business. You need to know, um, from for example, production. Okay, that's your product, right? How do you get this product out to the market, and then how do you get this product like listed, for example? So that that is a it's a whole learning curve that you have to go through. So, I really agree with what Joseph mentioned. I think the packaging is like so 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 important because, like, for example, Spotify is going to receive like so many profiles every single day for like new artists. How are you going to stand out? Like, how are you going to be like that one person that Spotify decides? Okay, today I want to put you on this playlist, or like for example, mm. any editor want to put you on this playlist. How how are you going to be that one? And mm. then if your song, if you think that your song is like so, so good, it's always subjective, right? Music is subjective. Mm. So like editors might think that, oh, this song is a bit nicer. But then when your profile comes in that, oh, for example, I have this certain number of following. I know that this song is going to have like a certain point of traction. The editors might put you like within like the top consideration to put in the, ed- the edit, edit mm. list, right? So like just said, I think it's, there's a lot of uh, scale on it. It's not like a linear graph. It's more of, how do you like plot your graph to reach that like final result? Which even myself till today, I'm still trying to figure it out because it's like so, so difficult. But at least for me, I put in a lot of effort on my social media. La. Like I try my best to do content and uh, like try to build my profile by writing more songs for like dramas or even like other people. So that when mm. I have my profile, when I send it out, it's a solid one. So I think... Um, it's something for a lot of us to consider, even myself. I'm still learning. Uh, but I think, yeah, that, that, that's for me. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I think I should clarify. I think the platforms and their editors, actually, they definitely will listen to the music. They will not make any decisions without listening to the music. They love music as much as we do, probably. The, but the thing is that these platforms are still a very visual platform. So they will, of course, take into account like what kind of promotion photos you give them and the story that you are trying to tell because they then need to go and sell that story to their their users. So yeah, just to, so the platforms are actually like of course they they're supposed to support artists, but also they have a responsibility to users, which is why that presentation needs to be nice at least uh, when you're pitching to them. Yeah. So end of the day, I think every platform has a moderator, and of course you know uh, being viewers, we want to look at. Interesting talks, like just like this, <laughs> some interesting live stream that give you informative, you know, all the information that you will need as an artist. So, okay, just maybe we can go to the next question. How is, a, I mean, pretty, pretty much curious, curiosity. Mm-hmm. Um, how much, how do they compute streams and revenue? The platforms? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. We can share, maybe how, how are the payouts like also, you know, just, you know, basically these, these are all salaries for artists, you know, how, yeah. how they actually you know, get there. So I think um, it's quite complicated the way that platforms compute streams and revenues. I mean, so basically once they get the streams in their system, every single platform, they have different, they have different payment models. They have different uh, products through which they will calculate revenue and the revenue for those products will be different. For example, for Spotify, they have, uh, free for free users of the platform, they have advertisement based uh, revenue models. And so 
um, that would be obviously a lesser cut or a smaller rate than their other product, which would be the premium, Spotify premium, where it's more based on the subscription model and everyone is paying like a set fee to use the um, use Spotify every month. So they basically the platforms for each artist or each song that is released, they will have to look at how many streams come from um, which, how many streams come from paid users, how much streams come from like uh, ad supported users. And then they will calculate their rate, which I don't think, I'm, I don't have the rate on me right now. And then they will send, they'll basically, the platforms will take their cut and then they'll send it to Believe. Believe takes our cut and then we send it back to the um, to the producer or like to the artist. So that's how it will work in like the most simplest form. And because Believe is directly um, linked to a lot of these platforms. So um, we are the simplest form, but in other cases, it might there might be some more cuts along the way. Yeah, if maybe you're like signed with a label or a distributor who has to go through third-party distributors in order to get to certain platforms. So there's so many different like ways that it can be done. Um, and in terms of the payouts, I would say quarterly, like we do it quarterly. We do payouts quarterly, but I'm not sure if that's answering Terence's question or not. <laughs> I think it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, it can be quite complex, you know, from... Um... From from label perspective as well, and 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 yeah, as much as we know, you know, um, I think the labels are doing their job as well to actually compute and um, do all the stream counts and stuff. It's not not an easy job. Mm -hmm. that, that is a painful administration, I would say, because I do publishing myself as well. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I have to look at figures every month, and it's crazy. So, uh, yeah. By the way, we just just to also find out um, a question from Jimmy: Can we sign up two different? distributors that are in different regions or I mean territories for example one that distributes internationally except China and the one that only distributes in China yes I think the short answer would be yes but the long answer would be you would have to look at uh, whether you have the leverage to do that or if now is the right time to make that move and why you want to separate it because if you are trying to get a good deal from like a particular distributor then you should give them like a worldwide in order like worldwide deal in order to get all the support that you can from them but if you are so if you do want to split it you must have like a good reason for it yeah but yes it is possible okay what kind of publicity can we get from distribution channel i mean what kind of help should we ask for from this um, role yeah, so I think it differs from like distributor to di distributor, but most will have relationships with platforms. So I guess you can just look at what kinds of coverage that artists are getting on those platforms. So like banners or playlists or like any of the other specific things that different platforms have, like they have, they usually have different campaigns or different things. And Podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. Or like uh, KKBox has each team. Sometimes yeah. they uh, ask people to go, invite people to go on that. So I guess you can um, look onto specific things that you you want to know more about, and then you can just ask your distributor. Yeah. But mostly the help that we, the publicity that we can provide is just limited to the platforms. We don't do, for example, we can't help you pitch to media companies or anything like that. It's mostly just uh, distribution. Yeah. Okay, now from the floor, we have Daniel asking this question. Is it true that um, you know, the, what appeals to China? I mean, I mean to, for, for artists to be... Let me see, let me get this. I, I, I think what he means is that for artists <laughs> to, to kind of have a presence or to succeed, for example, in, in they China. They have to be physically there. Do they have to be physically there? Yeah. And he also asked, what advice will you give to an indie artist without, without a team, team without, without a high budget. budget? Yeah. Maybe focus on these two questions first. Um, so is the question like, what advice will I give in terms of distribution or just in general? I think in I I think I would say in general in general yeah from your perspective. Um, I would say. Is it true that artist has to be there physically there? You know, if let's say we are distributing uh, our music, is really distributing in that area. You know, in 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 China, for example, and it's good for us to be there to actually run the promos. I think that's what he meant. Oh. Will, will um, we get higher stream count, better stream counts? I think. Of course, 
to get the best reach in any market, like a rule of thumb would be like you as an artist need to be relevant to that market. So the most obvious way for you to be relevant to that market is to be there. But um, I think it's not always necessary, especially if he's talking about himself as an artist who doesn't have any resources. Maybe he's not in a position to relocate even at the moment. So overall, I would just say like should be organized, should try and learn as much as he can about every aspect of the music business. Like anything he thinks about like, oh, how are these people getting like media coverage? Like look into that. How are these people getting their music on the platforms? How are they getting playlists? Just any questions that you get, just try and answer them yourself or like ask people for help. And um, just be very Titi. How do you say Titi in English? Like Positive. very active. Like, yeah, you should. Enthusiastic. You should, yeah, you should be very active and like self, self-sufficient self because like when you're an independent artist, you are the only person who has that vision most likely for you, what you want to do. And your job is to impart that vision to different stakeholders and make sure that they understand enough to want to support you. So, yeah. I, I think we received comments also saying that, you know, um, Hubert is success. Uh, Hubert's success is actually related to a, you know a little bit of luck. Um, maybe Hubert can share a little bit. Is it is it pure luck uh, or, or actually from my perspective, um, I would say Hubert Hubert actually puts in a lot of effort <laughs> in trying to make those things. You know, waiting at waiting outside the award, yeah. uh, six uh, no, hours. The, the, the the six hours. You know, waiting. I would not do that. <laughs> I think it's not easy, you know, to, to be honest. And you yeah. have to have a lot of effort to find out where these people stay, where they are and all those things. Am I right, Hubert? Maybe you can share. I, I think I think in anything we do, of course, luck is important. Uh, in everything we do, like luck is something that we always need. But whether the luck and opportunity comes together, I think it is whether you want to create the opportunity or we want to just wait for the opportunity. But for me, I feel that I'm the kind that I feel that since I'm already in this industry and it is, so difficult, at least for me, in my point of view, it's so difficult, right? Uh, how do I break out of this difficulty? How do I break out of this, all, all these problems that people say that, oh, it is difficult to make it in the music scene. But for me, I, I feel that that's all what people say. But if you do put in an effort and then like you try to hustle your way to, even if you don't get maybe 100%, you might, you might get like 5%. And sometimes that 5% can make, for example, that 5% can, um, be a miracle and then you like you explode into the scene or whichever then that will that will, that will be how like you you you, you follow on with a, follow on with a success right but i feel that how is very really important and i believe joseph and terence all know like we, we all know that to be sustainable in this industry you can't just do like one thing and then expect that one thing to succeed you have to do like so many things and then see how it goes and then follow the trend for for that thing so yeah, for me, because I feel that, you know, like, because when I was there in Taiwan, um, I felt that I had already spent so much time, so much money, so much effort, might as well just fang so ipo, right? Like, just do it. <laughs> mm, yeah. So regardless of where, you know, how much resources you have, you have or not, you know, I think it's, it's more of how we actually push everything forward. Mm. Uh, I believe uh, for every placement, every sync, every... Every opportunity one artist have most probably would be dependent on how much one person do. You know, to just just for example, you know, a bodybuilder most probably have a very nice body because they work out every day. Mm. So, so for example, I think if if those who haven't followed Asian Pop Weekly, you know, go and check out what was the reason behind Asian Pop Weekly to actually be doing um all these activities, you know, to promote music for ten years. It takes a lot of hard work as well. And for mm. for example, Hubert most probably. If you have noticed him on uh, TikTok, he's producing videos every day. He wakes up at 6 a.m. in the morning and I receive his texts in 6 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> and he sleeps as early as 11 p.m. So, you know, as late as 11 p.m. to 12. So, so I would say, um, I mean, to, to, to kind of round up, I, I think it is not just about luck. I think uh, when the opportunity falls, I think both of uh, Hubert and Joseph would most probably agree with me that uh, when opportunity comes is how prepared is the artist yeah yeah, yeah. definitely 100 percent. i think it's yes that particular opportunity may have been luck in the sense that it was a coincidence that this person found you or whatever but the fact that 
that person liked you enough to reach out or to make something bigger out of that collaboration it's not just like it's because you've been prepared like you've been ready all along and being ready that consistently takes a lot of work but it's also because like maybe Hubert has been like so consistently working at his career as an artist and as a producer that when it came he was ready and he just took it and then everything else just followed so yeah I don't think I don't think it's luck I think it's that particular incident was maybe luck but everything else was hard work yeah yeah I, I think most most probably uh I, I guess nobody would mind you know about any comment or whichever more importantly we want everyone to actually you know all budding artists all aspiring musicians to have that positive you know mindset to prepare yourself for the music journey you know if you you guys remember this quote um uh quincy actually said that music there's no in the, there's no music industry in fact it's it's actually music is actually a business so you have to manage the business on your own you now try to do as much as you can um in whatever way that you you can sell your music all right so um thanks for joining us in this session um it's definitely insightful um hubert um and yourself anything to add on you know what 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 encouragement do you have for all the artists or all the audience that are listening to this live stream um let me think I go first. I go first. I will start with you. Yeah, you go first. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I think for me, um, like standing as a viewpoint of an artist, right? I feel that be thick skin, cause um, if you think about it, if you don't be thick skin about like the opportunity that you want to pursue, um, that person won't even remember you, right? But if you are thick skin and you dare to ask that one question that might be awkward and stupid at the time. That person might remember you and then find you for further opportunities. Like just today, just today, um, there was this Hong Kong guy that I met in Beijing, um, like two years ago. He he says he can't even like properly remember me because but because I'm on his what WeChat, then he just called me and then asked me whether I want to take on a movie like um like movie team song job job right. So, but it was all because uh, I knew that he was going to be there for the dinner. And I asked my friend whether I can join him for the dinner. But then I sat there quite quietly eating my stuff and then drinking like my alcohol. That was how we created the opportunity. And when he called me, he said, I don't remember you. I honestly don't remember. I'm sorry. I can't remember you. But because of that like short incident, it really, really happened. Now. So I really feel that be thick skin about everything that, okay, not say everything, but be thick skin about stuff that you are very confident at. And then try your best. Because if not, um, if you get rejected, then so be it. find another person. But but at least you have tried your best. And then also, I think um, talking about distribution for today, right? I think um, I think find I think it's very important to find your find your targeted audience. I think it's really important to find that um, top tier audience that you want to find, and then spend more effort on it. And then also don't put everything there, but also spread out a little bit, but don't, don't, don't overstretch yourself like, oh, like Joseph said. So, um, do your products properly, market yourself, package yourself properly. And then when you are out there, um, people will see, look at you differently. And then that is, that is where you can get so much more opportunities, so much more, um, like visuals, eh, not visual, uh, so much more eyeballs on you. Lah. So I think that's very important. Okay, cool. Joseph? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, very short actually. I think the main thing is like know why you do what you do and then don't give up. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, and second yeah. what he was it. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's all, all about how, you know, we started with the, 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 that, that um, drive to make music as well. You know, we want to influence people. We want the positive influence. We want to share with people our music and stuff. So I guess it works both ways. Uh, nothing is nothing comes without you know no pain no gain i would say so thanks for thanks for joining us in this session thanks hubert thanks joselle and uh, hereby we like to end our session today so feel free if you have any uh, questions feel free to pop us any questions at info at singpop.sg and also you can you know remember to like um asian pop weekly as well and rem remember to like our sing pop facebook page and follow us closely for all the updates that are upcoming you know to talk about the industry to talk about anything that you need at, at being an artist you know to talk about the publishing and stuff so do join us um in the next episode of 
uh, sing pop live stream. <laughs> I want to say yeah, sing pop quickly. I'll, I'll, I'll add something. I think okay, okay. you all should always remember also that Joselle is a media outlet, right? So, <laughs> so you know what to like do. her stuff, uh, talk to her, like communicate with her, network with her. That's also one network, right? So, yeah. um, Asian pop really has been around for 10 years and it has... Uh, 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 it, has, uh, it has credibility so having your stuff on that media outlet is going to help you a lot mm-hmm. so since we have already brought yourself right to your faces then that is something that you guys should work hard for yeah that's what yeah. I yeah mean. you see we created the opportunity for <laughs> yeah. all the recording artists and the viewers out there so grab your opportunity opportunity right now and you know you can get uh, Joselle get a hold of her through the page you know text her your release Please, you know, pass her your kid. I think that's all you can do. And of course, um, be nice, be humble, be hungry. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So we end off okay. today's live stream session. And uh, thanks, JM, vol- volunteering his time, uh, our live stream um, engineer. Who's Thank volunteering you. His time right now, you know, all the way till 9, 9.40. So yeah, we, we're going we're gonna to go for dinner. And thanks, everyone. See you. Thank okay. you, Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks Bye-bye. for watching. Bye. The Level Up Podcast is brought to you jointly by Blossoming Bridge Creative and Asian Pop Weekly. Be sure to follow on our socials at Asian Pop Weekly and also check out our website if you're looking for more Mandarin or Asian music content. If you like what you're hearing on this podcast, be sure to like, subscribe and follow and we'll see you on the next one.